thank you very much, um, and welcome to this really complex and fascinating topic. Um, before I proceed, I'd like to introduce our um, other panelists only briefly. Their bios are actually in the program, but um, as we get to their parts, I'll, I'll give you more detail. But right now, uh, Leah Rutman from ACLU, and um, Teresa, I'm losing your name here. <laughs> Teresa Connor um, from Compassion and Choices. And then um, Jamie Shirley from the University of Washington nursing faculty. And when each of them talks, what they will do is tell you what brought them to this issue, tell you what the role of their organizations are, and then um, talk about the issue as they see it. I came to the issue of hospital mergers because I read in the newspaper several years ago about the proposed merger of the University of Washington Medical Center with Peace Health. And the, I have a long background in public policy, and so what was going off in my head was light bulbs about why can um, a, a religious organization of any sort merge with a public sector organization like the University Medical Center. So I started investigating, and what I found out was that the issue is far more complex even than that. So you'll hear a lot about that. Um, I was later asked, I, oh, later I went to a um, panel meeting at Town Hall, um, Seattle Town Hall, and uh, ACLU and Compassion and Choices, two of our panelists here are representing those organizations, sponsored a panel, and Mary Kay Barbieri, for, um, who's also in the audience, was in that panel. And they were talking um, in great detail about what the implications of some of these mergers are. When I talk about merger, um, if you've read The Voter, you will already be aware of this, but I um, want to make it really clear to those who have not. When I talk about a merger, I'm not just talking about the con consolidation of two organizations to create a third brand new organization. That is how some of these changes are happening. But others are actually acquisitions where one organization takes ownership of another. Some are affiliations where the two organizations agree to affiliate and work together in some way. Um, another one is a conversion where something goes from a, a nonprofit to a profit. A partnership, which is a more formal affiliation where the, part, the parties are presumably equal. And all kinds of various configurations of those. What they have in common is they have agreements by which, or contracts by which they agree to operate, they define roles and responsibilities and that kind of thing. And so it's in those agreements that we're finding some of the issues that, are, um, that you'll hear about now. When we talk about a, a religious hospital or a secular hospital, um, the issue for the religiously owned or operated hospital is not the religion. So the League of Women Voters has, of course, a very strong um, principle of freedom of religion. That's, that's part of our national foundation, and um, we totally agree with that. The issue for the League of Women Voters has to do with the assurance that patients will get the kinds of services that they need um, at the time they need them and in the way that they need them. So League of Women Voters has some very specific um, adopted positions on health care that I want to read you segments of. Um, the first one is in the National League of Women Voters, um, the basic level of quality care. Every U.S. resident should have access to a basic level of care that includes prevention of disease, health promotion and education, primary care, including prenatal and reproductive health, acute care, long-term care, and mental health care. That's pretty broad-based, and um, it doesn't speak to end-of-life issues particularly, that we do not have a position on that, but the, the issue is access to care. The, um, another policy has to do with reproductive rights, um, including abortion. The League of Women Voters of the United States believes that public policy in a pluralistic society must affirm the constitutional right of privacy of the individual to make reproductive choices. So um, when an individual is prevented from making that decision by um, somebody who's organizing their health care, that becomes an issue. Then the State League has a position, which I'll try to make shorter here. 
ensure universal access for all residents to a comprehensive, uniform, and affordable set of health services. These services shall be available regardless of one's health status or financial status. Provide, provide seamless coverage and continuity of care to the extent possible, regardless of changes in life circumstances, such as change in employment, marital status, financial status, or health status. And it goes on from there. But the point being, um, where you get your care should not drive, in, in the league's position, what kind of care you get. And so with that, I'm going to stop and introduce Leah Rutman. Leah is with the ACLU. Um, she's a policy counsel for the ACLU of Washington. Her work focuses on the impact of religion on health care and religious secular health system affiliations. Prior to joining the ACLU, Leah was an associate at an international law firm working on commercial litigation. She has also worked and volunteered domestically and abroad at many human rights organizations. She received her BA from McGill University and her JD from Columbia University School of Law. And Leah's going to set the stage for um, the other two speakers. So welcome, Leah. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight. I am supposed to set the stage, which is a big task. And I thought I'd sort of start by telling you about how I ended up here being policy counsel for the ACLU of Washington, specifically on essentially this issue. Um, so I was actually living in New York a year and a half ago, and when this job became available, the ACLU of Washington was telling me this is a huge, huge issue. It's happening all around our state. This is a big problem. We really need someone full-time to work on it. Living in New York, having a general idea of the laws in Washington State, everyone knows of Washington State as being very liberal, having great laws, so I wasn't really sure if there was a problem here, to be perfectly honest. I was like, really? How bad can this be? Um, so then I moved here, I took the job, and one of the things I am tasked to do, well, it's a very interesting task, but it's difficult, is to get stories across Washington State from people who have been impacted by religion influencing healthcare. Um, so I thought I'd start today by just sharing one of those stories with you, which really highlighted to me, who came in kind of skeptical, that this really is a really prominent issue in Washington State and a really important one. Um, so this story involved a woman who was pregnant. She had a much wanted pregnancy. Um, at some point during this pregnancy, she began bleeding profusely. So like anyone else, she went to the nearest hospital to her, the emergency room, to try to get help. Um, when she went to this emergency room, there was an ultrasound done, there was a fetal heartbeat, and essentially they told her at this time that there wasn't much they could do right then and to go home. Um, she went back and forth in and out of this emergency room for almost six days, extreme bleeding and cramping, tremendous amount of pain, but she was refusing to take any pain medication because she didn't want to harm the fetus. She really wanted this pregnancy. Um, after six days, many ultrasounds later, she had, at multiple times, checked WebMD, because we all do, even though we're not supposed to go on the internet, and thought she might have a uterine infection. So she had brought this up twice during this time, saying, is there a chance this is what's happening? Both times, she was told not to go there yet. So finally, after six days, she was admitted, and her doctor, who had privileges, but was not an OBGY, uh, was not um, an employee, but he had privileges, told her almost immediately, you have a uterine infection, your life is at risk, your reproductive health system is at risk. I can't tell you what to do, but I'd recommend terminating this pregnancy um, immediately. So at this point, oh sorry, so at this point, I had a, it's supposed to be ladder. Um, so at this point, this woman had to make a really difficult decision without any forewarning that there was even a problem um, to terminate the pregnancy. She made that decision. And when she did, the doctor turned to her and said, because you are at a religious health system, I now have to go talk to an ethics committee to see if I can perform this procedure. If I can't, I've made arrangements and will get you to a secular facility, but it might take up to four hours to get you there. And this woman was not in a good situation for transport. Um, in the end, the ethics committee approved the procedure, but at that point the woman had already miscarried and was septic, which means very, very ill. Um, she lived through this experience, though, and hopefully will go on to have a healthy pregnancy. 
Um, but this story really highlighted this issue for me because it isn't necessarily people overtly saying you can't have these services. Sometimes that's what, what's happening. But in other instances, it's also like a lack of knowledge and a lack of willingness to tell people what's going on and not being allowing the provider-patient relationship to really take off and do what it's supposed to do. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk a little about defending healthcare access for all. So the ACLU is a huge proponent of re religious freedom huge proponent of religious freedom. We have fought many cases to defend religious freedom, but we never think religion should be used as a vehicle for discrimination. So that's where we sort of come at this issue by. We should always protect religion, but we have to make sure it's not being used to discriminate against people. Um, the ACLU believes that you should have access to lawful best care medical treatment and the ability to make healthcare decisions without input or restrictions based on religion. So there are various religious health systems in Washington State. Adventist Health, Ascension Health, Franciscan, Peace Health, and Providence. The last three are the ones we're really gonna be discussing today. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is religious secular health system affiliations and why they're a big deal in Washington State. So religious secular health system affiliations are occurring throughout the country. They've been occurring more and more and more. There are various reasons given for why this is occurring, one of the most prominent being the Affordable Care Act, which created new requirements on hospitals, and therefore smaller hospitals sometimes feel they need to affiliate to survive or to provide certain resources, such as electronic medical records. But for whatever reason, they're occurring more and more. And the weird thing is, Washington State has become an epicenter for these. There are so many occurring in Washington State specifically. Um, so in 2010, around 26% of the hospitals in Washington State were religiously affiliated. Now, today, in 2015, that number has risen to almost 46, 47%. So it's almost doubled and it's almost at half. And I want to be really clear there, however, and Cynthia had started off this conversation. Whenever I'm talking about this, I'm calling these affiliations because there's no legal meaning for the word affiliation. It can mean you make a partnership to agree to provide certain services. At the same time, it could, it could mean an acquisition. So the depth of these agreements are different and the depth of these affiliations, but they're all contracting with each other in some way or another. Here is a chart in, here's a map of the percentage of beds in religiously affiliated hospitals in Washington state in 2010. The darker the color, the more religiously based beds there are. This is 2010. Could we click to 2015? See how many more areas in this chart are darker at this point. And that's just a little example of what we're seeing throughout the state. Um, recent health system affiliations that have occurred, I just wanted to list off a couple of them. You have Peace Island Medical Center and Peace Health. So Peace Island Medical Center was formed through a union between Peace Health, which is a religious health system, and a public hospital district, so a public entity that receives taxpayer money. When Peace Island Medical Center was created, they now have to follow Peace Health's rules, which include not providing any direct referrals regarding services they don't approve of. That includes abortion and death with dignity. When Harrison Medical Center affiliated with Franciscan Health, Franciscan is a religious health system, Harrison stopped providing prescription and consulting services for death with dignity. And I think one of our other presenters will get into sort of what that is. Um, just to go down quickly, when Swedish Health Services in King County affiliated with Providence, they stopped providing certain types of abortion services. Pacific Medical Center is a really interesting example because those are clinics. We're not just talking about hospitals here, we're talking about whole health systems. And these are, I think, nine clinics in like King County, Pierce County area. And when they affiliated with Providence, they stopped providing prescription services for death with dignity. Um, the list goes on and on and on, and we'll talk about some of the other examples as we move forward. I wanna highlight again, we're not just talking about hospitals. Um, medical clinics like PacMed, medical laboratories are also at risk. Um, there are multiple stories around the state where laboratories have tried to stop providing services to Planned Parenthood when they've affiliated. In Bellingham specifically, a few years ago, the bishop tried to tell Peace Health to stop providing laboratory services to Planned Parenthood. Um, there was an uproar over this, go Bellingham, and those services are still being provided, but it is at risk. Medical student training is a huge one. Um, 
it is legislative session and there are so many bills going on around about medical training, but basically you have UW, the University of Washington, which has affiliated with Peace Health. Um, their agreement is fairly secular in nature. If you read it, it's more for tertiary and quaternary services, but how it will play out in the future is really interesting. Of enormous concern to us this summer, um, Washington State University, so a public land-grant university, signed an affiliation agreement with Providence which is a religious health system, to form a consortium. And this was going to have a clinic on Washington State University property. And this entire consortium was going to be bound by religious doctrine, by the ethical and religious directives on the contract, in the contract. So the ACLU and some of our great grassroots activists, one of them who is sitting right over here, um, sent a letter and got very involved on these issues. And once it was made public, the religious health system rescinded that comment and the group has done a great job of really trying to ensure that religious doctrine won't, won't supervise this clinic. But these are serious things that everyone really has to keep an eye out for because they're, they're happening around our state all the time. So what's really at stake here? To us what's at stake from the ACLU's perspective is reproductive health care, end of life care, and LGBT health care. Um, so why? So the thing that we look to here are the ethical and religious directives for Catholic healthcare services. We look at them because they aren't authored by doctors or other health providers. They're authored by the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. Um, so essentially, or directly what you have, is religious doctrine is dictating service. This is a small excerpt. There's, I think, 73 or so directives. Um, so I'm gonna highlight some of the issues that can occur because of these directives. Um, the ethical and religious directives for Catholic healthcare services forbid various services, such as certain types of contraception, vasectomies, fertility treatments, and certain end-of-life services, um, specific things in advanced directives, and death with dignity. So specifically, the directives affect reproductive health care. Fertility treatments are not allowed. They state that reproductive technologies that substitute for the marriage act are not consistent with human dignity. Um, so that could mean various things, including things like in vitro fertilizations and things like that. The directives also affect reproductive health care in that they do not, Catholic health institutions may not promote or condone contraceptive practices. It's unclear what this really means, um, but it does mean that it could be used by certain health care systems to say we won't provide certain contraceptive services. Um, abortion is never permitted under the ethical and religious directives. Direct sterilization of either a man or woman, whether permanent or temporary, is not permitted in a Catholic healthcare institution. And just to be clear, these are all direct quotes. They're not sort of taken from the document. Um, so talking about end of life care, you have advanced directives. So generally speaking, the directive states that an advanced directive should be honored as long as it is not contrary to Catholic teachings. So for many of you out there, the concern people have is you could potentially go to make your advance directive, think you're protected, and then a hospital could fail to abide by it. Um, and I think our, one of our presenters will probably talk more about that issue. I don't think that's been a huge issue in Washington State so far, but it's always something to be aware of. So death with dignity is forbidden. So many of you may already know, but death with dignity was an initiative um, I think it passed in 2008, voter initiative, so people wanted this, essentially stating that um, patients who were terminally ill could access lethal medication to allow them to respectfully end their lives. And there is a whole process to go into to get that medication. Um, but essentially, under the directives, it's absolutely forbidden, and it states that patients experiencing suffering that cannot be alleviated should be helped to appreciate the Christian understanding of redemptive suffering. And the one thing I want to say, everyone always sort of gets a laugh out of that one, um, but there's not a problem with a statement like that if someone wants to experience that and wants to obtain those type of services. The issue that comes in is when people who come to this hospital who don't share that faith, or who don't want this, are then forced to not access services such as death with a dignity and are instead forced to experience this. So LGBT healthcare is also a key concern for the ACLU. Um, whenever I say that, people automatically think about visitation rights, um, rights in terms of surrogate rights, things like that. That absolutely is a concern, but there are other issues that come up. One of these issues are fertility treatments. As I mentioned, 
the ethical and religious directives prohibit many, many fertility treatments. This can have a disparate impact upon the LGBT community because that's how a lot of members of the community get to start a family. Similarly, um, I think in the page you have in front of you, there is an ERD that talks about um, your right, but also the requirement of protecting the inherent dignity of your body, essentially. I think it might be number 23, 29, somewhere in the 20s. So why this is a concern of how this could impact transgender health care? Because when we're talking about transgender health care, um, I was at a meeting once where a priest interpreted that particular provision to mean that if a woman had the breast cancer gene and wanted to get a preventative mastectomy, they could not because it would violate that ethical and religious directive. Um, that is one person's interpretation and not necessarily what everyone, how everyone would interpret that, but it calls into question concerns about what does that mean if you want to make changes to your body that are important or necessary for you and how a hospital or a health system could react to that. I'm gonna talk very briefly about the doctor-patient relationship because you have a wonderful ethicist who can do it far better than I can. But essentially, the ethical and religious directives really in some ways come between the patient relationship and the provider relationship. Because if you are supposed to follow those directives, how are you necessarily ensuring that you're doing the best thing for your patient and that you're putting their interests first? Because these directives require that you adhere to them as a condition of your employment. And many of these hospital systems within Washington State, specifically state in brochures, that a condition of employment is to adhere to these. So it wouldn't be an ACLU conversation unless I talked about the law a little. Um, so what I want to talk about is how the law could be impacted by these, or how these are impacted by the law, these affiliations. Um, the Washington State Constitution specifically states that public funds are not to be used to support religious establishment. The interesting thing, or problematic thing, we have occurring here is you have public hospital districts, in some ways, using state funds, so affiliating with religious health systems, and then using some of their taxpayer funds to support these new systems. Um, one example I'd give is San Juan Island, the Peace Island Public Hospital District one I told you about. Their contract stated that at least 95% of the public hospital dis district's tax revenue, so their taxpayer money would go to Peace Health. So you have taxpayer money going to the religious um, health system to run a system that does not allow certain services, in information, and referrals based because of religion. So there are potentially constitutional issues. Um, we are also very concerned when it comes to discrimination. As we talked, LGBT discrimination issues, but also discrimination against women uh, because they're not getting access to services they should have access to. Um, death with dignity, as I mentioned, is also a significant concern. So I also want to touch upon the Reproductive Privacy Act. Um, it states that every woman has the fundamental right to choose or refuse birth control. Every woman has the fundamental right to choose or refuse to have an abortion. And if the state provides maternity care services, benefits, information, they have to provide the substantially equivalent termination services, benefits, or information. This is an amazing law, from my perspective, um, that was passed in 1991, which is a really unique Washington State thing. We're really lucky to have these protections in place. Um, but what do these protections mean if we're having all these affiliations that result in decreasing access? What does it mean to have a fundamental right to choose or refuse to have an abortion if you can't obtain those services easily? I think that's a question that we all have to think about. Um, so I just really quickly want to touch on some of the work that's been going on in this state. So. Um, a group of allied organizations work all the time on these issues. Um, we're always coordinating our efforts. And I think it was in May 2013 that we sent our first letter, one of our first letters, to Governor Inslee, essentially asking for a moratorium on agency decisions um, relating to these hospital transactions. And the issue was these are happening all over the place, nonstop. We need to sit down and think about this. We need to figure out a solution to this, and to, except you can, because right now they just happen, 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 they're being approved, and we need to figure out what's going on. 
the governor came back with Directive 1312. So he read the letter. I want to point out that Compassion and Choices was also part of that letter, as was, I believe, People for Healthcare Freedom, one of the representatives who's sitting there. Um, so the governor took this letter really seriously. And he essentially said, you know what? I'm going to ask the Department of Health to look into some of their regulations to see what we can do about this. We're going to look into hospital licensing. We're going to look into certificate of need. And we're going to try to figure out what to do about this. Um, so then. Rulemaking occurred, and essentially one of the key issues with hospital licensing that all our groups were concerned about was consumer transparency. Because it's bad enough if there's no way to obtain the services, if your facility says I won't obtain it, it's even worse if you don't know what services are or are not available. Because when you're really ill, the last thing you need to be doing is going on Google and trying to somehow figure out what's going on. So basically what our organizations were saying is we need an easy, consumers need an easy way to know what services are or are not offered at the very basic need. Doesn't solve the problem, but that's like a very first baby step. Um, we had actually advocated for a checklist of services, so sort of a hospital could say yes, 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 or no, no, no to services. Um, but instead, the Department of Health decided that was too burdensome and instead put forth a new requirement that requires every hospital to provide um, policies on their website and on the Department of Health website regarding reproductive health, end-of-life services, and discrimination. Um, I do think this is a big step forward. It definitely is insufficient. Um, what we have been finding is that these policies are really, really unclear in many instances, um, incomplete in others, and so we've been working on reviewing all of them and determining what else can be done. We really would strongly prefer our checklist, to be perfectly honest, but it is a step forward and a step in the right direction. Regarding certificate of need, so a lot of you may not have heard about that because it's this really sort of arcane idea. But basically, um, certificate of need says that a state approval is required before the sale, purchase, or lease of all or part of a hospital. Now here's the catch. It's sale, purchase, or lease. And as you heard Cynthia say, these things aren't always called sale, purchases, or leases. They're called things like affiliations. And basically, these affiliations were managing to evade certificate of need review. So the Department of Health, the, the state, did not have to approve these because they weren't calling themselves state sales, purchase, or leases. So what the governor said and what all our organizations said is, that's not okay. Half the time you are having acquisitions here. Half the time you are having partnerships that really change control. You need to look at what's actually going on and just not those three words. So now there is a new definition, which is currently being litigated, so we'll see how things turn out. But there is a new definition for sale, purchase, or lease, which essentially means you need to have state approval if there's any change of control going on with the hospital. So this was definitely a step forward, because it means hopefully the state will have a little more input on these and a little more control, especially because the certificate of need requirements requires the state to consider whether there is going to be an elimination of service and how that will impact people. So the last thing I just want to talk about, which we're pretty excited about, is two bills, a House bill and a Senate bill that just dropped. Um, so this goes back to protecting the patient-provider relationship. And what we're talking about here is that a healthcare facility or healthcare entity should not be able to uh, prohibit a provider who wants to practice or is practicing safe, timely, effective, efficient, patient-centered, equitable, evidence-based, and medically accurate patient care. So why all those terms? That's a huge mouthful. It was hard for me to say. Um, basically, we spent a lot of time thinking about what, what, what should a doctor be doing? And we looked to the Institute of Medicine. And the Institute of Medicine, which is a very well-known entity, which has advised the government, had advised when it came to the Affordable Care Act, essentially said that six of those terms are really things that everyone should be aiming for, for performance. So if a provider is doing all of these things, a facility shouldn't be able to say, no, you can't do that. You should not be able to limit the information and referrals or services if the provider is doing everything as they should or even going above and beyond that. So essentially what this bill is aiming to do is to say, let's keep the provider-patient relationship as the provider-patient relationship. Let's not let a facility's religious policies get into that. Let's let, not let a facility's policies, even if it's not about religion, get into that. Let's just let a patient and provider relationship stay as is. Um, so the last thing I'd like to say 
is that you guys all got sent, have these little cards, which are sorry, we're collecting stories, we're all collecting stories, because the most important thing to tell lawmakers, to tell the public, is to talk about what's happening. So if anyone has any stories or knows anyone who does, please get in touch. All the information is on those cards. Thank you very much. So Leah has been coordinating a statewide coalition of a lot of different organizations that are involved in this, and she's just doing a fabulous job. So thank you, Leah. Um, our next speaker is going to be Teresa Connor. Um, she's a licensed attorney with more than 30 years of public policy experience. She doesn't look old enough, does she? <laughs> in the federal, state, and local levels. Um, her consulting firm provides policy and political analysis, strategy planning, and stakeholder engagement services to community advocacy organizations committed to ensuring that patients have access to comprehensive reproductive and end-of-life care, including abortion and death with dignity. Teresa works in Washington, D.C. as a health policy fellow in the office of Congressman Jim McDermott. Before her fellowship, she worked for two years um, as Director of Government Affairs for Compassion and Choices National, and for 15 years as Director of Public Policy for Planned Parenthood Public Policy Network here in Washington State. So Teresa's going to talk about this issue from the perspective of compassion and choices. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you, thank you very much for the, putting the forum on, and thanks to all of you who actually turned out tonight on a very rainy, cold night to participate. This is an important <coughs> issue. Um, before I get started, I'd like to see a, a show of hands. I need to put this up because I'm tall. How many of you have an advanced directive or a health care power of attorney? Okay. How many of you are going to get an advanced directive or a health care <laughs> power of attorney? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would suggest on your way out the door that you stop by the table at the back. There's a gentleman in a, in a burgundy-ish pink shirt, and he has information from Compassionate Choices. They can provide you with a comprehensive uh, living will, um, health care power of attorney document, and tools for decision making to think through what your personal values are, and to talk to your family ab with, about, and to talk to your health care provider about, so that you know that you've communicated your end of life wishes, and you actually should strive to get a commitment from your health care provider to support you when that time comes. Do not assume that your health care provider will do so. Ask and get their commitment. Um, there's also information about the Washington Death with Dignity Act, as well as some uh, background information on the law. So I encourage you to stop by. So Leah has described the impact that the ethical religious directives have on reproductive care. Less recognized until recently has been the serious impact that those type of policies and restrictions have on end-of-life choice. First, I will speak to the issue of advanced directives, and then I will talk about the Death with Dignity Act. But before I do so, I'd like to say I'm glad Leah pointed out that this is not just a hospital merger issue. This is an issue involving health systems taking over or affiliating with other health systems. Health systems, including two Catholic health systems in the state of Washington, recently taking over state-regulated insurance companies. Catholic hospital systems taking over medical groups, labs, assisted living facilities, hospices, and nursing homes. I would also say it is not only an issue of religious restrictions. Both the state advanced directive law and the death with dignity law allow any provider and any facility to refuse to participate. This is why you need to speak with your provider. You need to ask the hospital that you believe you will go to whether they will honor your choices at the end of life. Um, with respect to the Catholic religious ethical directives, 
I would also point out that you saw the Adventist health system here in the state of Washington. There are other Catholic, con or pardon me, religiously controlled facilities, and people need to be aware that they too have restrictions. But with the ERDs, depending on how they are interpreted, they can undermine patients' rights in the areas of informed consent, advanced directives, pain management, and palliative sedation. The directives define euthanasia to include any act or omission intended to cause death. That the ERDs are subject to interpretation and that statement could be interpreted to include many legally recognized and medically accepted practices, including withholding or withdrawing treatment, including antibiotics and other medications, renal dialysis, ventilatory support, and artificial nutrition and hydration. It can impact the issue of deactivating an implanted cardiac device, such as a pacemaker or a defibrillator. It can impact the issue of palliative support for patients who voluntarily stop eating and drinking or, or choose to go off of life-prolonging treatments such as dialysis. It can impact the issue of whether palliative sedation will be available for extraordinary suffering at the end of life, especially if the patient requests that medical treatment. It can impact prescribing or administering medication for sedation or prevention of breathlessness and other suffering when a patient is removed from ventilatory support in order to ease the dying process. Following the Terry Schiavo case, you look, take a look at your, your uh, directive sheet. Directive 58, is that on there? Directive 58 was, it dealt with um, artificial nutrition and hydration. It was revised to say that a Catholic health care facility has an obligation to provide artificial nutrition and hydration for patients who cannot take food and water. This directive runs counter to a patient's constitutional right to refuse unwanted medical treatment, including artificial hydration and nutrition. Directive 61 encourages healthcare providers to help patients who are not getting relief from pain to appreciate the redemptive, the, the Christian understanding of redemptive suffering. Leah spoke to this, but this directly impacts the requests that patients are making about palliative sedation and pain management. Directive 59 specifies that a patient's end of life decisions will not be honored if they conflict with the Catholic medical teaching. The determination of whether an advanced directive conflicts with Catholic, uh, Catholic moral teaching ultimately resides with the local bishop. It's ultimately a matter of that person's interpretation. And that determination will revolve around the patient's intention in filling out their advanced directive and their intention of asking for particular medical treatment. If it had anything to do with the perception of advancing the time of death, it can be an issue with the Catholic facility. If the patient said, uses the wrong words, just let me die, I'm ready to go, that can signal an intent to end their life, and it crosses the line into where the ethical committee might have an issue, and the bishop may have an issue with that particular treatment. So depending on how the directives are interpreted and applied, they can limit the amount of information provided to patients about end-of-life options, thereby foreclosing fully informed consent. They can prevent a patient from choosing aggressive pain management, including palliative sedation, and accepted practice in medical ethics and law. They can result in healthcare facilities disregarding an advanced directive or a decision made by a healthcare proxy. And they can result in patients enduring against their wishes medically unnecessary, unwanted, and invasive medical care. At the core 
this issue really comes down to a question of individual liberty. Law and policy should not put in institutions, whether secular or religious, beliefs above a patient, and they should not shield healthcare providers who deprive patients of the information they need about legal medical treatments. Dying patients must be able to make their final medical decisions based on their own deeply held values and beliefs without the fear that their choices will be denied and without the fear that their choices will force them to be transferred to a different facility in order to get their wishes honored. Now in Washington, the passage of the Washington Death with Dignity Act has really brought the issue up, I think, in even greater clarity. The law allows any individual healthcare professional or, in, or healthcare systems, whether church controlled, secular, or public, to opt out of participating in the law. And as Leah mentioned, the hospitals are now being required to submit those policies to the Department of Health and to post them on their website. Now what the rule said was post your end of life policy. And it was completely up to the hospital to choose what that meant. One of them posted a policy that said, we define death as X, Y, and Z. Others talk about their advanced directive policies. Many are utterly silent on the issue of death with dignity, or they are evasive. We comply with the law. So how is any patient or, or community member going to know when they go to the Department of Health website or they go to the hospital website whether their choices will be honored by that facility? The lack of clarity is not acceptable, and it is a good thing that the advocacy groups are going back and asking for uh, clarification. But the other issue about that regulation is that it only applies to hospitals. There are many other areas in the healthcare system where restrictions exist. As I mentioned, the advanced directive law also allows providers to opt out. So nursing homes, hospice, assisted living facilities, all of those facilities should have to develop and post their policies. Compassion and Choices has been in contact with the governor and talked about this issue and has requested that at some point the other facilities also be required to develop those policies and disclose what their position is to the community. Now, just recently in the state of Washington, there was a case of a gentleman who was in hospice requesting information from a Catholic health system about death with dignity. He was denied information repeatedly and took his own life. That health system has now changed their policy to allow providers to speak openly and to provide information. It should not take that type of a situation to encourage providers and facilities and health systems in the state of Washington to be transparent and to provide information. Ultimately, protecting someone's rights in law means nothing if, if you cannot get the service in your community, if you cannot get the service from your provider. So again, in closing, patients should never assume their provider will honor their wishes. Please ask. Thank you. Our third speaker is Jamie Shirley. Um, Jamie is going to talk about the kinds of ethical dilemmas that healthcare providers find themselves in. Jamie has a primary appointment at the faculty of the U School of Nursing at the University of Washington on the Bothell campus. She teaches and writes about ethics, policy, and professionalism, and in particular addressing the concepts of autonomy and dependency in contemporary society. Her clinical background is in oncology and hospice nursing. In addition to her academic work, she is a clinical ethics consultant for the University of Washington Medical System. She is also a primary instructor 
for the certificate in guardianship offered by the University of Washington Professional and Continuing Education that is required for all professional court-appointed guardians in the state of Washington. Welcome, Jamie. I was invited to provide the healthcare provider perspective on this issue. Um, and the first thing I have to say is I cannot provide the healthcare provider perspective to you because I am only one healthcare provider. Um, I can tell you a little bit about the breadth of perspectives the healthcare providers have on this issue. Um, and I can also tell you that much of what I'm going to say are perspectives that a single healthcare provider holds within themselves. I think there's a lot of cognitive dissonance around this, these issues of consolidation for healthcare providers. Um, so the first issue that I want to address is just simply the issue of increased affiliations, increased consolidation of healthcare institutions. So on one hand, healthcare providers are just like ordinary citizens in the sense that they are worried and skeptical about these increased consolidation of healthcare institutions. Because as these institutions become larger, they acquire more power, and any given healthcare provider, by contrast, then has less ability to influence what happens in those institutions. Additionally, as Leah alluded to, there are in issues of provider autonomy in terms of choice of where they will practice. So if you are living in a small community that previously had two hospitals, as a patient you used to have a choice of which hospital to go to, but now if they consolidate into one, you no longer do. Similarly, as a healthcare provider, you now only have one option for an employer. And if that means that you have issues with one of them for any variety of reasons, potentially not this practice issue so much, but you know, sometimes you just don't want to work for that employer anymore, um, there's now not an option for folks living in smaller communities in terms of being able to change their employer. Um, so this is an issue for healthcare providers. Health care providers are concerned about increased consolidation. At the same time, um, healthcare providers are also very concerned about the ways that lack of care coordination and lack of care management leads to poorer care and poor health for patients. We know that when there is poor care coordination, there are increased errors, there are increased readmissions to the hospital, that folks with chronic illness are more likely to not have their symptoms well managed, thus resulting in acute illness, and all of those things lead to increased costs. Um, and we know that we are spending too much money on health care given the ineffective outcomes that we receive. As a nation, we spend more money per capita on health care than any other country in the world, and we do not have improved outcomes to show for it. Our health outcomes are poorer than any other industrialized country. So there are ways in which these affordable care organizations, which is the hot term um, that comes out of the Affordable Care Act, that these accountable, I'm sorry, not affordable care organizations, accountable care organizations um, are something that are viewed by many healthcare professionals as a positive move, right? Because they're going to increase by vertically integrating doctor's offices, laboratories, hospitals, rehab facilities, home care. By integrating those into a single system, we have the possibility of increasing improving our care coordination for patients as they move through the system, as they move from one piece of the organization to another, which should improve the experience of people who are obtaining health care as well as improving health outcomes. But we've done this before, right? 
Uh, if you remember the 1980s, we did managed care organizations, and they were supposed to do all of the same things, and it didn't go well. It didn't go well. And accountable care organizations are supposed to be different than managed care organizations, and indeed there are some pieces that are in place that give us hope that they will be different. Um, but we worry, but we are skeptical that this will really be different and that we have just forgotten our history and we're going round the same thing again. Um, so there's this tension for healthcare providers um, about the advantages and the disadvantages of working in these large organizations. Um, similarly, when we think about healthcare providers working in these religiously affiliated healthcare organizations, um, we have similar ways in which we're pulled in two directions at once. On one hand, um, to the extent that these organizations are trying to constrain practice in all the ways that Leah and Teresa have described, um, this is a problem for providers, right? Because providers are faced with two sets of rules that they are trying to trying to meet. There's the set of rules that the institution is trying to impose on them. And additionally, there is the set of rules that come from their own professional codes of conduct. So the medical association, the nursing association, the social work association, all of those healthcare providers have codes of ethics which dictate or which um, create duties and obligations for healthcare professionals. And all of them have as one of the fundamental elements of the code that providers ought to demonstrate, enact, their respect for patients' autonomy, the rights of patients to make decisions for themselves. And one of the ways we do that, one of the ways we enact that respect, is that we provide informed consent. And informed consent includes um, making sure that patients have information and access to all available options, all appropriate options. And so when an institution tells providers that they cannot provide certain things that are completely within the standard of care, or more egregiously, they say you can't even talk about these things that are within the standard of care. It puts healthcare providers firmly in between these two incommensurable sets of rules. And this is always the, set, the problem with, with rules, right? Um, and here's the ethicist in me coming out. <laughs> um, when, when we all agree to a set of rules, rules are very useful, as long as we all agree to them, because then we know what to do. Um, but when we have sets of rules, when we disagree about which set of rules to follow, or we find ourselves in an environment where we are being asked to follow two different sets of rules, you know, we're between a rock and a hard place, because rules don't change according to context, or they, they are rarely changed according to context. Um, and when they are interpretable rules, as rules always are, um, it's just that more confusing for healthcare providers to know how they may act and how to act in ways that they can feel like they are um, acting ethically. And so there's a lot of moral distress expressed by healthcare providers when they find themselves in these situations. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, it is also true that many, many healthcare providers really um, love working in religiously affiliated institutions. And many of them explicitly choose to work in religiously affiliated institutions because they are awfully, often strongly mission-driven institutions with very strong mission statements, making very strong claims about social justice, about concern and care for the underserved and the vulnerable. 
And so providers see a, a, um, a great coherence between the mission of the institution and how they understand their fundamental professional values and virtues. And they can feel comfortable there, right? That's what we all want in our lives, is that we can go to work and work in a place where our employer affirms our personal and professional virtues and values. And that we can go home at the end of the day saying, I did good work here today um, because, because who I am was affirmed by the work that I do. Um, so healthcare providers in general have really enjoyed working in these institutions because of the strong mission drive of these institutions. Um, I teach nurses at um, University of Washington Bothell and they're nurses who have previous community college degrees Many of them have been working for a number of years and now have returned to the university to complete their bachelor's degrees. And in a room of students, I can always pick out the ones who have worked at Providence. I always know because they speak a language that is strongly ethical and they are very clear about being able to connect action to ethics. They can say, here's what I do, and here's why I'm doing it. Um, and that's a really wonderful thing. But those providers feel doubly betrayed by their institutions when they find themselves then in these binds of being asked to betray their professional standards by not being able to talk about the standard of care, not being able to provide the standard of care to their patients. Um, and so this is a really difficult struggle for providers who have previously felt themselves to be at home in these institutions and now feel like they're being asked to do something different. Um, and it's not, um, you know, many providers neither provide end-of-life care nor do they provide reproductive services and so they don't sort of have, they haven't noticed in the past um, that they were in institutions that asked them to do something that was against the standard of care. But as this becomes more and more of a conversation, it becomes more of an awareness um, they're having to confront the fact that my institution isn't maybe asking me not to comply with a standard of care, but they're asking my colleagues to do that. Um, and to the extent that professionals act in concert with each other, then sort of anyone who is, anyone in my profession who's being asked to ask, act unethically, that concerns me. Um, so I don't have, think that healthcare professionals have any solutions to this. Um, I will say that I, it's interesting um, to me to think about this issue of wanting healthcare organizations to be explicit. I understand the urge to have healthcare institutions be explicit. Um, but um, one of the things that I hear from my colleagues who work in these institutions is that some ambiguity is actually to their advantage. Um, as long as things are left open to interpretation and nobody clearly says you can't do this, well then maybe they can. <laughs> maybe they get to interpret the rules. Um, and so this tension between wanting things to be explicit so that we can say, look, this is a problem, um, and in the short run, people saying, just let's not talk about that, because as long as we don't talk about it, then there's some space for us to negotiate. There's some space for us to say, well, no one told me I couldn't, and so maybe I can. Um, so I think there's some struggle for healthcare providers in thinking about what is the right approach for, for moving forward on this topic. So thank you very much. 
So um, the first person will ask a question, and I know your name, but others may not. So would each person who has a question please start by saying their name very loudly. Joan Lawson. Uh, we asked the Washington State Hospital Association, the Washington State Nurses Association, and the King County Medical Society if they would come before us. And thank goodness Jane expressed some of what they must have said. So how can we stop the... Um, religious hospitals from um, affiliating with the secular hospitals that are losing money and really need them. Would that be to uh, stop giving them taxpayer money or will the Affordable Care Act make it all work out? The first thing I want to be clear about is, um, speaking for the ACLU and potentially my other panelists, we're not necessarily opposed to religious secular health system affiliations. We're opposed when religious values um, are imposed upon these institutions, resulting in problems with information, services, et cetera. It's not the actual affiliation itself that's problematic. If they could find a way to maintain their secular status, then it's not an issue we would necessarily have. Um, so I want to make that really clear. On top of that, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all situation. Um, I know taxpayer money was mentioned in this. Um, there have been situations now, I believe, in Bellingham and Olympia where taxpayer money was taken out um, of the equation. I, I think that's one way to look at it. I think at the ACLU, we literally meet every single week. I think there's seven of us, including my executive director, deputy director, legal director, legislative director, et cetera. And we sit in a room thinking of potential solutions to these issues. And we do that every single week. Um, I would say we have pages and pages and pages of ideas, and we've implemented a lot of them, but none of them are going to be that one solution. I think the most important thing that I could say to all of you is being really, really aware of what's happening. Keep up with your news. If you are part or members of any of our organizations or similar organizations that are concerned, read all your alerts, read all the information so that you can contact the hospitals nearest to you or the health systems nearest to you to say, I'm concerned about this. I think this is a problem. Them. Similarly, do the same thing with your lawmakers because it's going to take potentially years of educating people and getting the message out to really make a huge difference with this. Thank you. Thank you. Do either of you want to add anything? Okay. Next question. My name is Pat Griffith. I actually have a, a couple of questions, but I'll try to keep it to one. Um, group, I'm not a group health member, but I know group health is changing its affiliation from the secular Virginia Mason to, uh, to Swedish Providence. And I'm wondering what kind of restrictions are in their agreement and how they will be notifying their, uh, their, uh, their members. Do you want me to take that one? You can just do it. You just met with them? Yeah. Okay. So that is a fabulous question, and when that letter went out to all the group health members telling them they would change it, I think I might have received that 50 times in my email box that day. Um, so everyone is very on top of that issue. We have met with group health um, multiple times now, and the last time was actually last week, because we were very, very concerned that um, one of the key concerns is that group health maternity center is going to be moved to, the, to Swedish, essentially. Um, while... I have not yet seen the contract, so I cannot speak to it expressly. Um, I have never been more reassured with a conversation I've had with a secular entity who is in some way affiliating or partnering. Um, the, what they told me about the contract would seem to suggest that there will be significant protections put in place. Um, I really can't speak to it more because I haven't seen the contract and it's not my contract, um, but I would say that the ACLU was in large part reassured by, it, by the conversation. Can I say something How many of you are enrolled in group health right now? Okay. How many of you are members in group health right now? Okay, quite a few, actually. So those of you who are members will have received a ballot in the mail um, um, several weeks ago. And um, the issue of how Group Health will handle uh, assurance to its enrollees that they will receive all the full information that they need was addressed by a resolution to the annual meeting. And um, it was a board-approved one, which means that the board supported the membership taking that action. 
that was then sent out to the entire membership for a, for a ballot vote, and I haven't seen how it came back, but I'm sure that it probably passed. So now Group Health has the obligation to implement some kind of a system that will require that all of its patients get all of the information they need for um, all of the things that are in the law that Leah mentioned. And so I think of all the cases we've talked about, group health is probably the safest. Um, next. Can I, can I jump up and make one comment mm -hmm. on that? Having, having participated in years of these conversations around agreements, one thing we've learned is that the promised protections oftentimes expire in five years or in 10 years. So if you as a, an activist are engaged with an organization, that agreement should be for the life of the facility, in my opinion. <laughs> and we need to make sure that we aren't you know, letting them off the hook with a short-term agreement that sacrifices patient rights long-term. Thank you. Next question. I'm Kim Peterson. And my basic question is, what is driving all these murders? It's just a matter that the Catholics are so rich that they can go ahead and buy all the others? Or is there something else underlying it? Thank you. Thank you. So I can, I can speak to part of that question. Um, and maybe Leah can speak to the other part of it. I don't know. Um, so one of the issues around um, why all these mergers is simply that um, there really there there are two things going on. One is a realistic interest in trying to do a better job of coordinating care, um, and when you have a vertically integrated system, it is more likely that you're going to be able to provide manage a good well managed care for people, um, and that's something that we want, um, and that's also something that came out of the Affordable Care Act. So the Affordable Care Act has within it. Um, numerous incentives for hospitals, for healthcare systems to create these larger systems where people can be followed through all aspects of their care. That's something that the Affordable Care Act said, we want that, right? Um, and in addition, um, somebody mentioned the electronic medical records. And um, Electronic medical records are a good thing because, you know, when you go to the doctor's office, you fill out your form that has all the information, and then you go to the next doctor's office and you fill out the same form again, and <laughs> you keep filling it out, and, and, and people miss, and they ask you what medications you're taking, right? And so you miss, your cardiologist doesn't know that your pulmonologist just put you on another medication next week. With electronic medical records in a vertically integrated system, everybody's got all that information all the time. And so that's a good thing. So I think that those are the things that are driving consolidation. Now, can somebody speak to why the consolidations are all happening with the Catholic hospitals? Because I can't. Talk about the public health district. The public health district. Do you? Um, I want to introduce Mary Kay Barbieri, who is a People for Healthcare Freedom. Yes. Okay. Good. And she has some additional. Yeah, we're, we're a Skagit County group that was formed because all four of our public hospitals um, were deciding to um, affiliate in various degrees with Catholic health care systems. And we have been fighting a very hard battle for the last more than two years to keep our hospitals secular. Um, I, think, I think that the um, Affordable Care Act has been used as an excuse by uh, some of these institutions to take over other institutions. I think that small rural hospitals, such as the ones in my county, are frightened about some of the requirements of the act and feel like they need greater partners. I'm not sure that's actually true, and there certainly are ways of forming accountable care um, organizations that do not require the impositions of one organization's rules on the other organization. You don't have to merge. Um, you can have an agreement to, you know, have a specialist in this place work with this place without imposing religious principles on anybody. So I think that this is a, um, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, <laughs> But there really is a strong, strong movement in the modern Catholic Church, not the one I grew up in, but in the modern Catholic Church, to have the bishops put their thumbs and fingers on all 
on the enforcement of these ethical and religious directives. In the days when there weren't electronic medical records and the nuns were fearlessly and bravely taking care of the lumberjacks in the middle of nowhere, um, I think Catholic health care worked great. But the nuns had better ideas about how to respond to the real needs of the people, frankly, than the hierarchy of the church. And the nuns are the ones who are, first, they're disappearing. And secondly, they're being clamped down upon harshly by the bishops. And so I believe that this is a plan. It's part of a continuing plan. And the ethical and religious directives, I don't think it was one that you were given, actually say that uh, merging with hospitals or associating with, other ho with secular hospitals is a very scary, dangerous thing because secular rules might get implemented, but it's a very good thing if you resist that and have an opportunity to, Im to impose your religious rules now on secular hospitals. So that's my two cents. Uh, I'd, I'd like to add one additional comment, and that is um, if, if you take the religious part out of it for a few minutes and, and you look at a small public hospital district like the one in San Juan, where the voters voted to tax themselves to provide hospital services and then found that they weren't a big enough jurisdiction to really afford all the, th the kinds of things that are necessary and run the hospital well and expand it when it needs to be expanded. Then you look at those kinds of jurisdictions putting out the word that they need financial help. The primary systems in the state of Washington are in fact the um, religious hospital systems because they've been developed for the last 150 years. So I think without um, the conspiracy theory, there's actually a pragmatic reason why some of this is happening, and I think we can look at it that way too. Next question. <coughs> my name is Nora H. <coughs> You've heard my inspiring dance before, but we're talking about public monies going to private institutions, schools, religious schools, now hospitals, religious hospitals. So uh, moving from public to private, uh, but continuing to flow of the public tax dollars to pay for these things is a bigger problem. Uh, and I think that what we're losing, you know, is uh, employment discrimination with public money. So it was, there were rules that you could not discriminate against people uh, in employment for the religion or for a lot of other things on that. And also uh, equal access to all, regardless of a person's uh, religion or religious philosophies or whatever discrimination we have. So this is a, a, a bigger problem uh, that's going on uh, in our state and it's in the United States and it's in Columbia as well. So this is a global issue that does have a driving money behind it. So just my my comment or question to you is employment discrimination. You know, what is going to be happening in terms of employment discrimination and discrimination for people who want to use the services? Thank you. So employment discrimination is a really interesting question when it comes to this issue, um, partially because a lot of employment discrimination laws in the country, but also specifically in Washington state, have exceptions in them for religious employers. So they are exempted from certain requirements. Um, these have been narrowed somewhat by recent case law, but they do in general exist. So employment discrimination is always a concern when it comes to this because the extent to which if you are discriminated against, you could then hold your employer accountable um, could potentially change. I haven't specifically heard about instances when that have, uh, has occurred recently in an affiliated um, health system, but of course that's a concern that everyone should keep in mind. Um, I think discrimination is one of the key issues we're looking at here. I know I had noted the Reproductive Privacy Act before. I think discrimination against women is something we're going to have to be looking at. Um, I can't stand up here and say we have the absolute solution of how we'll handle those things. I think, again, it's sort of 
we are looking at potential legislative solutions, as you see, saw. We are exploring this through regulatory solutions. We are also always interested in any litigation opportunities that we have coming our way. So we're really trying to look at it through the gamut. And I think really importantly, when it comes to discrimination, specifically employment discrimination, is to be working with the provider community as well, because they know best what they need in these situations. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd say when it comes to employment discrimination, something to be really aware of, post the Hobby Lobby case is any issues with access to contraception um, from your employer employment health plans. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ashley, and my question is around advanced directives. My husband and I both have them, and health care power of attorney. But if I one of us gets hit by a bus, we don't really have a say in what hospital we get taken to. So what options are available for the, the spouse of someone if? they get taken to the hospital that they wouldn't have picked, and that hospital is not honoring that advance directive. Hospitals who will not, or which will not honor, typically will include in their policy their procedures for transferring a patient when the advance directive is in conflict with the facility's position. And that is true of religious and secular hospitals. So the spouse would work with the hospital to move them to a facility which would honor the directive. Now, um, I'd like to add one more thing about advanced directives, which has always irked me as a Planned Parent, former Planned Parenthood lobbyist. In Washington statute, and in many state laws, in the advanced directive law, there's a sentence that says, nothing in this document will have an effect if I'm pregnant. And it was put in there at the request of the lobbying entities representing religious um, advocates. And the, the form in the statute is not mandatory, but people need to be aware of it because lawyers just pick up the language and put it into a document. And if you're of reproductive age, you might not want it there. So I'm a little bit confused about something. So uh, these uh, religious hospitals, uh, are they tax-exempt organizations like the churches are? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's sort of not fair, isn't it? Because, you know, they're, uh, not only are they tax-exempt, uh, the uh, other organizations can't compete with that. And it also means that that's another subsidy that we're giving them, you know, out of our taxes. So, you know, why, are, why should they be able to say anything? I, I would put the burden back on the, on the people and the legislators who have over the years, since, 19, six, since 1970, so the, the history of the right given to these institutions to refuse was put into state law here in Washington for the first time when we passed the abortion initiative in 1970. And it was reiterated in 1990 when 120 was done. And it was put into the advanced directive law in 88 and repeated and expanded when that law was changed. So they have been perceived, these, these religious conscience clauses have been perceived as necessary compromises in order to achieve these very important rights in the law. We ourselves have supported that language which gave those institutions the rights. So the issue then becomes, if the state as a people or as a government is going to allow that right, do we not have another responsibility to assure access to those services? Is the issue denying them the right to refuse or assuring access in every community in the state? I don't know, I would put it out there. Those laws have dollar limits or dollar triggers. So if the deal is less than that dollar trigger, it doesn't apply. It applies to certain types of transactions. So if the deal is not one of those transactions, it does not apply. And as Leah pointed out, 
a lot of these um, agreements are not, they're not mergers. They're not a sale. They're not a purchase. They're not a lease. What's interesting in that certificate of need law further down, it says the following things are not subject to certificate of need, paying off an existing debt. So what happens is one company comes along, one corporation, and they pay off the existing debt of the other corporation and become the controlling member of the board as part of the deal. And they take it over in such a way that it's not subject to certificate of need. It's not subject to those other regulatory tools. And that is part of the problem. Thank you. One more quick, and then I'm going to close. Yes. Um, and I agree with everything Teresa said. And the one thing I wanted to add was it is something we're still interested in, the antitrust angle of this. Um, we have seen cases in other states, um, some which have been successful. I believe there um, was potentially, I think, this session, a legislative work session, just discussing how these affiliations relate to antitrust issues and everything concerning it. So it is something that we want to keep an eye on and consider looking at because depending on getting the right situation um, and the right fact pattern is whether we could really explore the antitrust issue. So I'd say we should give our panel a big hand. <laughs> and thank you to Teresa Connor, Jamie, um, I did it again, Shirley, <laughs> and Leah Rutman, and Mary Kay Barbieri, and to Joan Lawson, who put this all together. Thank you. And thank you all for being here.